Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see so many bright and uh, smiling faces this early in the morning. Um, <laughs> but of course, it's hard, it's hard uh, not to have a smiling face when you have this beautiful venue and uh, all these wonderful people making a difference in the world. Um, well. As the uh, CEO of Medicinal Drumix and your host, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to the CanMed Summit. Uh, your presence here certainly underscores your dedication to helping advance the cannabis industry. Uh, and that's a collective effort I'm, effort I'm certainly thrilled to be a part of. Uh, before we delve into today's uh, discussions, uh, I would like to acknowledge and welcome our breakfast sponsor, American Cannabis Nurse Association. Their, their advocacy for uh, establishing cannabis and nursing as a specialty is truly commendable. Uh, it marks a major milestone in, in integrating cannabis into mainstream healthcare. Uh, and as my brother Kevin mentioned yesterday, we, we obviously have, uh, my father battled stage four cancer for uh, a number of years, and uh, it really was the cannabis nurses that made all the difference in making sure that he had the, the proper healthcare and uh, quality of life. So we're, we're certainly forever grateful for all the healthcare professionals and everything they've done. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, welcome this panel and this uh, discussion to our uh, panel. Thank you. Good morning. All right, that's pretty loud. Uh, it's 4 a.m. for our West Coast people, so raise your hand if you're actually still sleeping. Yes, yes, me too. But thank you so much for attending this morning's breakfast with the American Cannabis Nurses Association. My name is Nicole Boss. I'm the current president of the ACNA, and our board and many of our members out here are delighted that you've joined us to come learn about how you can participate alongside nurses and allied healthcare providers within the cannabis medicine field. So I want to start, I know it's early, like I said, but I want to start with the healthcare providers in the room. If you could raise your hand, especially our nurses as we're coming up of Nurses Week. Thank you for your dedication to cannabis medicine, for your dedication to the patients that we serve, uh, whether they are a quote unquote true medical patient or a typical cannabis consumer out there. And that's typically who the ACNA works with. We work with all cannabis consumers to live out our mission, which is to educate, collaborate, advocate, research, and for policy development. And really that's how you, as non-healthcare workers, can get involved with the American Cannabis Nurses Association. If you're a researcher, we'd love to have you come join us. Share your research with our community. We are the nurses who are seeing the patients, interacting with those patients, and we have a lot of anecdotal evidence that I think is really valuable when we're looking into the traditional side of research and what the important work that our higher education institutions and research, uh, private research institutions are helping us with. So join us for research. We also will have a excellent conference coming up next year, which we'd like to invite everybody to attend. So today's focus is who is the cannabis nurse? And we wanna show the profile of a lot of what we do in the different areas of the cannabis Hello, okay, the different areas of cannabis medicine. So we're gonna go ahead and we're going to jump from each speaker, they'll do a quick introduction about themselves and then we'll come back and we'll round it up together. So I'm gonna first pass it off to Deanna Summers. Welcome, a little test here on my speaking, so. I'm... All right, well I gotta get in my teacher mode, so I'm, I'm an academic, so I guess I'll speak directly into the mic here, so. Uh, welcome, my name is Dr. Deanna Summers. I uh, have my master's degree in uh, nursing um, in specialization in pediatrics. I mean, um, my PhD is in public health and uh, with a specialization in community education and health promotion. Um, I've been in higher education for the past 17 years. I've been in various roles from being a faculty to a director of a BSN nursing program uh, and associate dean, which is relevant to why I'm here. I'm also the chair of the credentialing committee, and uh, I'm a uh, board member, as Nicole has stated. Uh, I appreciate yesterday's conference uh, presentation by CNN making the announcement, and I'm just going to repeat it right from the direction of the quote by the American Nursing Association, the scope and standards, and our specialty recognition. 
So on September 27, 2023, the American Nurses Association, representing the interests of the nation's more than 5 million nurses, announced the formal recognition of cannabis nursing as a nursing specialty, which is described in the cannabis nursing scope of standards of practice. That's huge, so congratulations to all of us. So what is the definition specifically of being a cannabis nurse? Cannabis nursing identified by the ACNA, American Cannabis Nursing Association, as a specialty nursing practice focused on the care of the healthcare consumer seeking education guidance in the therapeutic use of cannabis. So I'll repeat that one more time. So cannabis nursing is identified by the ACNA as a specialty nursing practice focused on the care of the healthcare consumer seeking education and guidance in the therapeutic use of cannabis. I pause for a second because I want to let you know that when the scope and standards for cannabis nursing was uh, written multiple times, uh, many of us know our cannabis healthcare consumers by patients or clients, and the ANA recently changed their, their wording, so I just want to like, give a little highlight on that for us nurses who know we call our patients patients. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to break. Um, additional things, so as stated by the ANA, what are the scope and standards is what my point is going to, or what is the scope of practice? What does that mean for nursing? So as I'm going to quote from the American Nursing Association, that nurses overall scope of practice describes the services that qualify a healthcare professional deemed competent to perform and permit to undertake the in keeping with the terms of the professional license. So really the bottom line is, is that we have to maintain within our scope of practice based on what type of nurse we are, whether we're a registered nurse, a master's repaired nurse, or an advanced practice nurse practitioner. Um, so what are the scope and standards specifically? They really set the minimum standards for our nursing practice. The second thing is it describes the who, what, where, when, and why, and how of our nursing practice. So I'm going to take a moment, and um, I did bring a copy of the fourth edition of the American Nursing Association's uh, fourth edition of their scope of practice, and that's really the foundation for all nursing specialties. There's many specialties out there, pediatrics, hospice nursing, community nursing, emergency room nursing, um, and so again, this is the foundation for all of the nursing specialty practices. And each, so the uh, Candace Nursing Scope of Practice was written, we have 18 standards. The first six standards are standards that most of us nurses that are in the room that we know is the nursing process. So it'll be nursing, the diagnosis, implementation, assessment, I didn't say it in the correct order, but um, that's really the, the, the uh, first six standards. This, the last 12 standards, and I'm gonna read them off, is, um, is more it's called professional performance. And that includes ethics, advocacy, respectful and equitable practice, communication, collaboration, leadership, education, scholarly inquiry, quality of practice evaluation, professional practice evaluation, resource stewardship, and environmental health. So each of the 18 standards has competencies listed under those standards. So it's quite lengthy. And then each, each of those standards are written, they were written as three different levels. So they were written as a registered nurse, so if you're an ADN grad or a BSN grad, masters prepared, more, more for the educators, and then for the APRN. So each of those 18 standards, I just wanted to be really clear about that, that they have each has their own standard and their competencies as it was written. The other thing I, I wanted to point out that we haven't really highlighted, we have the scope of practice and, and what was the A, um, a and A had approved for us, but there are other topics that were written, and of course I'm really encouraging and plugging uh, for, for everyone to purchase the book, but um, I wanted just again just highlight some other topics that are discussed in the book. And uh, we all know cannabis. We're all here in the room sitting. So uh, I'm hoping that other people that are not maybe just interested or like we say uh, curiously interested in cannabis. So the first thing that the book starts off with was just basic definitions of cannabis and of a specialty. Um, guided philosophy, core values, and ethical principles of nursing diverse healthcare settings in cannabis, cannabis as medicine, legalization of cannabis in the United States, qualifying conditions, regulatory concerns, consequences of the war on drugs, evidence-guided practice, medicinal cannabis use and employment, drug screening, occupational-related policies, 
NCSBN recommendations, I'm not sure. That those, again, maybe not nurses, NCSBN, that is the organization that is ultimately writing our NCLEX, and that's the, the big test that all the nursing students, we all have to take at the end of our graduation. Um, educational programs are, is also, and so overall it's not all encompassing of every nursing or every program that has cannabis education in there, but I, I did a pretty good job of uh, being pretty all-inclusive. All uh, that's including universities and college degrees, certificates, CEUs, um, other educational resources such as textbooks, journals, and other cannabis nursing education or organizations. Um, I want to just take a moment to share with everybody, this, this was a three-year endeavor. Um, with me and the team. And uh, it was multiple revisions. There, there are probably over 100 versions of this and multiple, multiple, multiple hours of editing and re-editing. The other thing is, is this was actually an application process. Um, just because we applied didn't necessarily know that we were gonna get the, um, the recognition. And when I originally wrote the scope and standards, it was written as, there's three different levels, and I just wanna kinda point this out. Um, again, another kind of big thing is, is that it was written as that we were emerging specialty. Nobody had really heard about cannabis other than us, right? I mean, we're all in, we're all in the biz. So um, when I wrote it, I wrote it in the tone of it being an emergency. Could be, uh, the, three, the three areas were emerging, evolving, or actually being a specialty. So after I wrote the document in its full entirety, about two years, two years ago, um, the American Nursing Association, Dr. Bickford, came back to me and she said, you, you're a specialty. She goes, you need to rewrite this as you at being a specialty. So I was super excited about it, but I had a lot of rewriting to do as well. So I, I just wanted to point that out that they, we've been through a lot of, a long process. Um, I currently am um, doing the final. There's, there's hopefully no more edits of the, uh, of the scope and standards of practice. It's been approved, but we're in the printing phase. So um, I wish today that I would have been able to have a copy, but I, I wanted to point something out. Um, I proved like I'm to the point of just like we're talking from a publication perspective. If you, I have here, I'm such a faculty person just to share with you. If you take a look at your flyer here um, on the lower right corner, it is a, just a kind of a preview of the cover that will be coming out. So it looks, it'll look something like this when it's all in print, but the cover will be green and then it'll say cannabis nursing on its scope of practice. So I'm super excited. Um, you might be at, everybody's like, where, am I, where can I get it at? So you can purchase it on ACMA's website. We'll have it available there. You can also purchase it um, by the American Nursing Association. And if you're really super excited, you can pre-order it on Amazon. So I just wanted to plug. So I'm gonna take a moment just for a second and uh, give a little pause, kind of, kind of look around the room. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm continuing on speaking. That was about the scope and standards. Um, I'm going to share with you my journey and uh, how I got involved with ACNA. So, I don't know, about six years ago, um, I, I've been in, in higher education for about the, the past 17. I've been a nurse for 33, but a few years ago, many moons, I made it the full-time leap into in higher education. I've been in many roles, and my past role was being uh, the associate dean of a BSN nursing program. I just started that position in July. It's kind of relevant because uh, what landed up happening is, is in, in nursing school, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but nursing students, we drug screen them uh, every, every semester or every quarter, depending on where you go to school at. And so what landed up happening is, is that I had a nursing student, she was graduating in December of 2019. And I was the associate dean and director, new to the position of July. Nursing students have the opportunity to choose when they want to take their drug screen. Uh, this student chose sometime in mid-July, got her drug screening back, and guess what happened? She came back positive for cannabis. Per our nursing policy at the university that I was working at, her, the policy was that she gets dismissed. She's graduated from nursing school four years at a private school in the Midwest, Chicago. There was something didn't feel right about that. I really struggled with that. I decided to just take a look and just do some assessment. I do have a PhD, I'm all into research. I hate when my students say this, but I decided to Google cannabis nursing. See if I could come up with any policies or something. So I, um, I found out that ACNA was having their inaugural uh, event in New Orleans and I decided to attend. There's one specific conference or, that I wanted to attend which had to do with uh, lack of education in nursing students and nursing faculty and I was raising my hand saying, yeah, that's definitely me. 
So long story short is, is that I um, decided to let the student, I, I want to stay focused with the student, I decided to let the student um, retake her drug screen. She was starting clinicals up in late August, and so I didn't have a whole lot of time. I know that there's a lot of you know, policies about when she could take the, you know, when she should maybe take the tests or repeat the drug test. So I, I waited as long as I could, so it was about 45 days for her, um, but we, we were kind of at a time crunch. Anyways, long story short is, is that she came back positive, or, I'm sorry, negative dilute. So one more time, she came back negative dilute. So I decided to call my clinical agencies in the area, and one of the things, if you're in the education and you're a nursing director, I am really at the mercy of my clinical, uh, clinical agencies for my students. And uh, I double checked with, and this is in the Chicagoland, she would not be able to attend clinical in any of the clinical arenas. So she literally was graduating in three months. Uh, repeat drug screen was negative dilute and the, the agencies would not take her. I did have to dismiss her. Mm. It, it was, it was mm. very, it was difficult. I had mom, dad, everybody was in my office, everybody's crying. So anyways, I, I do want to end with, I'm not finished totally ending, because I, I do want to move forward a little bit with ACNA. But with the student, she really wanted to be a nurse. And so the student, um, she you know, left the university I was at, she, re tried, she reapplied to another nursing program. She was accepted to another nursing program, but what I want to share with you is, is that she had nursing credits do not transfer over. So she had to restart her degree all over again. She, since then, I do keep in contact with her. She is a registered nurse and she's practicing the emergency room. So I'm very happy for her on that. I was able to change the policy for at the university that I work for, um, which is also interesting. So I changed the policy in the Midwest. Um, I currently am a Floridian now, yay for me. Um, and uh, we have graduation for my nursing students at where I currently work at. Um, and what, I was speaking to an administrator on Friday. This is like hot off the press. What she was saying to me is, is that um, she was interested, you know, again, another cannabis curious person in, in higher education, and she wanted to hear more about what I'm doing in ACNA. And what she asked me, or she actually informed me, is, is that at the university, at the college, is that their policy is um, they repeat twice if it's a negative dilute. She can, they, the student can repeat twice. And if they're negative dilute the second time, then they wait six months. There was no mention that she was, the student would be dismissed from the nursing program. So one of the takeaways that I want to just kind of point out is, is that we don't even have consistency in academia on what the policies are for nursing, nursing schools, and, and dismissals. And, and again, that was just very, such an impactful moment for me uh, with my, the nursing student at where I was working at in the Midwest. So the other kind of going on to, um, I shared with you about that. So my goal, my goal to kind of conclude this is, is that I just really would like to um, just get more into education, educate nursing students and nursing faculty. There's such a such a demand and such a need about cannabis in the endocannabinoid system, with regards to policies, procedures, and and really also is is that I would really like to thread in cannabis uh, education into the nursing curriculum. Any moment, any time that I have, I teach community nursing. I, I educate the students. It's my moment to educate students on, on cannabis. And the other thing I'm gonna end with this is that we're kind of a takeoff from yesterday is, is that the students know that they can approach me. So whether they have um, something they wanna ask for a friend about cannabis or a family member, um, they know that they can come to me and ask me questions on cannabis. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Deanna. So we've heard a little bit about the advocacy that can go on in academia, and I'm going to focus a little bit about what the ACNA can provide for nurses, but also how you as non-nurses and business owners can support and get involved with the ACNA. And then I'll touch on kind of my other day job, I suppose. Not that the ACNA isn't a day job. So as Deanna talked about, we have lots of levels that the ACNA can impact. We work with nurses as they're looking at their scope and practice, as they're trying to understand how cannabis can be weaved into their specific, unique nursing practice, be it in the hospital setting, be it as an entrepreneur. And one of the areas that we found where we need to work is on educating our nurses. So looking at how we can provide education as ACNA, as experts, 
but also reaching out to our nurses in our network that are already professionals. They're already doing this great education and how we can collaborate with them, especially as we have our hopefully published soon scope and standards. All of those education, it will need to align to that scope and standards so we can make sure that we're providing the correct education to set nurses up for passing their certification exam and getting that special credentialing, whatever that may be in the future. Along with education, we have the advocacy for nurses, looking at their licensure. As we know, not everybody is as welcoming to cannabis or cannabis medicine as we may hope. And it's having the dialogue when our nurses are looking at their license. Perhaps they're getting a call from their local American Nurses Association, that's the ANA. And they want to discuss a license, and this happens everywhere. Um, I live in the nice little bubble of California and Washington where this doesn't seem to be an issue, but we know a lot of our East Coast nurses that they can struggle with this as we have kind of uh, immature cannabis programs coming up and trying to understand how nurses can participate. I was so pleased to hear about Maryland and how they uh, request and provide the one-on-one -on -one consults or with a healthcare provider, but we don't have that in every state. I think actually Maryland might be the only state. Yeah, so great job to Maryland, but we have very immature um, kind of connection when it comes to industry. So I recommend that if you're in this space of industry, if you have a dispensary, if you have even um, working in that pharmaceutical area, bringing in nurses to collaborate. We see a lot of the anecdotal evidence as we work with our patients, as we'll hear from Sherry, how nurse entrepreneurs are working with a large populations, collecting data that can be utilized for making better cannabis medicine. So now I'm going to switch over a little bit from ACNA and talk about how nurses can participate in product development. I think we heard yesterday on the nursing panel, if you were able to join us, that nurses are looking to provide and make their own products and their own formulations because they're not finding it in the marketplace. And I think this is a really unique skill that we as nurses have turned to. We've found that we can do anything if we set our mind to it. And we can participate in that product formulation, looking at anecdotal evidence, but looking at research as well, and understanding what ratio of products out there may really help our patients over what they can just purchase at the dispensary down the street. So being able to participate and that product development is another valuable area where nurses can participate in this space in the industry, as well as, I would say, using the right verbiage, talking about it, right? Bridging the gap between what our cannabis patients are feeling, what they need, and what we can legally say based off of the guidelines that may or may not exist out there. So I hope that you can continue to learn about how the nurse can participate in industry and specifically as we turn it over to Sherry, she's going to talk about nurse entrepreneurship. Thanks, Sherry. I think it's on. Hello. Ooh, there it is. Hey, everyone. I'm going to stick to my script because sometimes I tend to be a little chatty. Um, so my name is Sherry Mack and I'm a registered nurse for the past 35 years cannabis nurse, cannabis patient, advocate, activist, and a very passionate podcaster, here to change the paradigm of health as a cannabis nurse entrepreneur and proud board member of the American Cannabis Nurses Association. Cannabis nursing entrepreneurship is the art of initiating, organizing, and expanding an original business venture that serves a market need. It requires blending innovation, expertise, and foresight to craft novel products and services to deliver value to a specific clientele. Being a cannabis nurse entrepreneur was not on my radar back in 2012 when I found myself on the other side of the bed with a very dysregulated endocannabinoid system and endocannabinoid dome. I was on over 18 pharmaceuticals. I was sick, I was suffering, and I was dying. I found cannabis as medicine when a 70-year-old nurse came to my home and shared with me her harvest from her garden. She disclosed to me that she had been using cannabis every day since she was 17 years old. That's 53 years of using cannabis, a little bit every day. She was not on any regular pharmaceuticals, nor had she ever been hospitalized. She also disclosed to me that her father was a pharmacist and carried cannabis formulations in his pharmacy in Boston 
prior to 1937 and the Marijuana Tax Act. I had a look at that. I've journeyed from registered nurse to patient to cannabis nurse entrepreneur. My cannabis nurse entrepreneurship began with my own need to help myself navigate the world of cannabis as medicine, which led me to help others with what I discovered and learned. At one point, I was so flustered, I sat there with my pile of dispensary medicines and I said, if I can figure this out, you can call me the green nurse. So prior to becoming a cannabis nurse, I was a medical center specialist, clinical nurse liaison, nurse educator in the big teaching hospitals in Boston, combining home infusion, home care modalities together for three big teaching hospitals. I helped build a primary care telehealth clinic at one of the Harvard teaching hospitals in Boston, creating nursing telehealth protocols, SOPs for nursing care and phone treatment. I was not able to return to my position because of my cannabis use, and I was never gonna go back to 18 pharmaceuticals. I had to reinvent myself, and cannabis was my guide. So cannabis nursing entrepreneurship has led me to find my niche in the space, building an ecosystem, a cannabis type of HMO with my business partner, Elizabeth Mack, at Holistic Caring and the Green Nurse in Bloomham. As you heard yesterday, nurse entrepreneurs are amazing and they're doing amazing things. Nurse entrepreneurs solve the four Ds in American cannabis. And it's the disconnect, the distrust, the disorganization, and the dosing issues. There's a disconnect between patients, providers, and dispensaries. They're not connected and no one's communicating. There is a huge lack of trust amongst consumers, patients, um, distrust of the products of people in the industry, and then the disorganization that we see. We have 38 medical states, 24 adult use states, and no federal system yet. And then dosing. Clinicians need to improve clinical outcomes. We all need to be involved in learning how to self-titrate and knowing the nuances of the endocannabinoid system and the endocannabinoid dome. Cannabis is much more than just the plant because everything that we do or don't do when we're talking to consumers and educating them affects how cannabis is gonna affect them in their body. Nurse entrepreneurs provide the solution. They provide the four Ps I'm gonna talk about that create value and purpose. Nurses create process. We're all about process, right? An ecosystem that we need to create to, and deliver credible care. Providers need to be included, all providers, not just doctors, nurses, and pharmacists, but all ancillary providers in cannabis education. And then products need to be vetted for quality care and standardization. And finally, personalization. Patients need, patients, consumers, and even providers need to receive individual guidance into how they can incorporate cannabis care and education into their current practice. So nurse entrepreneurs provide that. We as nurses see a lot of con consumers, sick people, patients that come to us and we need to be the bridge in our communities to help patients in hospitals, hospice and care facilities get the care and education they need to be successful using this plan. We have a quote. People are making great medicines. People are selling these amazing cannabis formulations, yet no one is truly interpreting how to use cannabis as medicine. That's what we do as nurses. The American Cannabis Nurses Association has been an organization that has supported my personal and professional growth as a cannabis nurse, and I am truly honored to be on the board of directors as a cannabis nurse entrepreneur to help advance the mission. And I'm gonna pass over to Tanya. Good morning. Good morning, my name is uh, Dr. Tanya Scott Kennedy, and I am the regional Clinical Services Director for Kaiser Permanente for Maternal Child Health. And my journey to cannabis has been an interesting one, to say the least. I've been a nurse for 30 years, very proud, and uh, born and raised on the East Coast. And when I ventured over, after traveling as a nursing leader for 15 years inside of my own business, I ended up and landed at Kaiser Permanente and um, decided to stay on the West Coast. Now, when you're raised in the South, you're taught <laughs> never to go to the West Coast. Bunch of heathens and hippies and all that. So I decided to stay. 
I met a cowboy 30 days after I got there and ended up marrying this dude. But let me tell you a story. On the first date, you know how you go back to the house and you're looking in cupboards and you're looking in bathrooms, you're looking to see how they live. You know, I'm from the South. We're gonna look around. And I went in one room and there was this, these buds hanging from a ceiling. And apparently it was harvest season. And I just knew the feds were about to jump, drop down into the house. And he explained to me, he said, you're in California now. He said, we do things totally different out here. So I realized that there was no way that I was going to be able to m m marry a person if I didn't know anything about the thing that he loved the most, right? And then he took me to a rodeo and I realized there were a whole lot of cowboys falling off of horses and bulls and all that, getting up and not taking anything for the pain. And I asked a question and I said, well, why is that? And one of the cowboys told me, he said, well, honestly, I used to use opioids and I don't want to chance it again. What I realized was that I had something to bring to the table. 30 years of nursing, 30 years of knowledge on how to take care of people. And this was a group of people who needed to be cared for. And there wasn't a nurse in the bunch to do it. But I also needed a job. And I worked for one of the largest healthcare corporations, integrated corporations, 75 years strong in this country. So I didn't want to lose that job. So I had to be smart. As an executive leader inside of an acute care medical center where there are vendors all day long wanting to do business with this company, I had to realize and figure out the best way to be able to reach these individuals while at the same time change the bias and the stigma <coughs> associated with cannabis nursing inside of acute health care. If someone looks like me and comes into the emergency room, smells a certain way, or even states that they use cannabis, the fear of how they may be treated because of the war on drugs is real. So in order to address this inside of acute care, I had to come out. So I came out as a cannabis nurse. And what I realized was that I didn't have to use cannabis. I just needed to know about cannabis. I know about fentanyl, I know about all that. I don't use it. <laughs> so my point was, I realized that if I followed the exact same map that got me to the executive suite, that I could bring cannabis to the executive suite the same exact way. And that's what I'm doing inside of Kaiser Permanente. I encourage nurses to get into their professional practice and follow the basic steps inside of an acute care organization. Learn everything you need to know about cannabis. Learn everything that you need to know about technology. What is the technology in healthcare? And can it serve your cannabis patients? that are coming and, and laying down in those beds. I also look at policy and procedure. Does your hospital even have policies and procedures? Arrest them. We live by policies and procedures. Pull those policies and see what's in there and start creating them. More importantly, partner with cannabis nurses. Partner and join organizations that will allow you to learn learn about the technology, learn about the practice, because moving forward inside of an acute care hospital, it's important that you're able to come out and it's important that you're able to speak to the craft that you're trying to put in front of all of the executives who are gonna make the decisions.
You understand that, don't you, Eloise? I pass it over to Eloise. Well, I just want to say we have some pretty badass nurses up here, and I just want to give everybody a round of applause. This is all volunteer hours that they have done to do the scope and standards of practice that guide our license and protect us when we fear, um, you know, many of us have worried we're going to lose our jobs many, many times. Um, I know Dustin's going to be speaking here in two minutes, so I'm going to be really quick. My name is Eloise Thiessen. I'm an advanced practice nurse. I um, started out in this industry about 10 years ago, became an accidental entrepreneur after I used cannabis to help me also get off multiple pharmaceuticals um, and then started my own education company and my own cannabis clinic. Um, I'm now at Stanford in the palliative medicine department where they purposely hired me because of my cannabis experience so that I can bring cannabis education to the patients who want to use it instead of or in addition to their other pharmaceutical, so I'm in a very medicalization model again, which is kind of a trip, um, but very much needed, and I'm grateful that I get to do this work, and I get to do it uh, unencumbered. We, um, I'm also, you know, like uh, Tanya was talking about, really trying to change the conversation within the organization. You know, Stanford's a historically very conservative medical organization, um, when we brought in Ryan's Law and changed our policy around that, I did end up meeting with the Chief of Staff who um, wanted to do a study on cannabis, so I'm really excited to say that we have submitted our first dosing cannabis study at Stanford for patients um, who have undergone radical cystectomies and are going to use it to try to improve the quality of life, so things like sleeping, appetite, nausea, even pain. Um, we'll all be monitored with actual cannabis dosing. We're going to be using Healer CBD products. It is hemp-based, um, but we're able to do THC levels large enough that I think will actually make a difference and get us some good um, data. And to be at the table with these conversations has been really interesting. The first conversation we had was that one of the physicians wanted us to have the patients take the THC um, gummies before the preoperative portion because he wanted to know how they would react. And I said, well, are you going to make them take their ondansetron or their oxycodone before they have their operation to see how they act, or are you just going to do that in the hospital and monitor them? And he said, you're right. Then we continued to have the conversation and we recognized that the majority of the people who will be caring for these patients in the hospital are very undereducated when it comes to cannabis. And so if they have a reaction, the first thing they likely will do is blame the cannabis. So we did decide that we will administer it preoperatively to see how they respond and document that so that we can come back when they are in the hospital and say, this is a reaction that they've had. We're not concerned about it. We're not gonna stop the cannabis. Um, we also wanted to work with a company that was willing to provide the product for free so that it was not a socioeconomic barrier for patients because that currently is the biggest barrier. Um, they can get their consultations for free or as part of their healthcare coverage. They still have to pay out of pocket for these medicines, so their ability to explore it is really difficult. They won't have to do that in this study. So I'm really grateful um, to our sponsor for that and the ability to be able to offer this to patients. So, we hope to take this study um, and then bring it to other academia centers across the nation and gather even more data around that, so um, to be continued. I know Dustin speaking, I don't want to take up much more time, um, but thanks for everybody who did attend. All right, a few closing words before we transition over. Again, the American Cannabis Nurses Association is here to build a network and hopefully work with other professional cannabis organizations that are looking to bridge the gap between healthcare, health information, health education, advocacy, and what we've got going on in this space as we continue to grow and evolve as the cannabis industry. So we invite you to have a conversation with us here today. We'd love to talk with you, understand how we can collaborate and work together and continue to push cannabis medicine into the future. Thank you for joining us for breakfast.